Praise the Lord. Shall we open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 21 and read verse 20? The fifth star means the fifth star is the seventh crystal light, the eighth devil, the ninth, the topaz. Praise the Lord. The stone we're going to learn tonight is topaz, the ninth stone. In the Bible, actually it's not topaz, but it's topazes. So there's an extra az added there, but most of the scholars agree it's topaz. The Hebrew term for topaz is pitada, meaning the yellow one. The stone topaz has a rich yellow luster and as colors go the color yellow speaks of hope and topaz speaks of divine hope so before i continue let's just have a glimpse of the stone now this is topaz the ninth stone of the foundation meaning the yellow one a rich yellow luster signifying <coughs> hope. <clears throat> the story is told of some sailors who were once marooned in an island in the Red Sea. Being marooned means it's a horrible experience to be marooned because you're deserted, you're alone. Being in an island, you're surrounded by sea. What does sea mean? C means there's no hope of seeing anyone. So, you're surrounded by the sea and you're cut off from all help. You, you cry, but all that you hear is the sound of waves crashing on the shore and cutting your voice off from people. So these people were marooned in this island. And it's a helpless, hopeless situation. It was on this island that they are said to have found a precious stone. Both the island and the stone were called Topazos, from which was derived the term Topaz. This stone, called Topaz, is the second stone on the breastplate of the high priest and the name Issachar is inscribed on it. You can just note down is in Exodus chapter 28, verse 17. What does Issachar mean? If you turn to Genesis 38, verse 18. And he said, What pledge shall I give to you? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets, and thy staff that is in thy hand, and he gave it her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. Is that the verse? Sorry? <coughs> yeah, I can read that. It's a guy as strong as counting down between two burdens. But it is the place where he was born. <clears throat> when Issachar was born, right, if you find the verse, you can let me know. When Issachar was born, he was named Issachar, saying, The Lord has given me my hire. The Lord has given me my hire. 
Has anyone found that verse? The birth of Issachar. Thirty eighteen, that's right. <clears throat> Please read that. And we are said, God has given me my hire because I have given my maiden to my husband, and she called his name Isaka. God hath given me my hire. Now the term hire is uh, has the meaning wages of payment or reward for some labor. God has given me my reward for my labor. The Bible says that the laborer is worthy of his reward. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 18 Paul says the laborer is worthy of his reward. But dear children of God, where the laborer is concerned, he knows that he will receive his reward only after his labor. But he labors for the reward and he is told even before what that reward is. So while he labors, he knows what his reward is and he's hoping to get that reward and he labors for that reward but he does not get that reward before he has to wait for it he has to hope for it my dad was an engineer and I know what it means by payday all his workmen would wait for it they worked they labored but they were waiting for that payday and this hope is that in that sense of waiting in hope dear children of God this is a very important trait of character that we must possess God is going to speak to us tonight many of us have faith but do we have hope Faith is good, but faith without hope will definitely lose its quality. Why? Because faith says now. Faith believes we get it now. But when we don't get it now, our faith begins to waver. Our faith wavers and wills and fails because we lack hope. We have faith, but we lack hope. If you turn to Psalm 123 and read verse 2, what do we understand of hope there? Psalm 123, verse 2. <coughs> Behold, that the eyes of servants look unto the hand of your masters. The eyes of servants, the laborer, looks unto the master. And as the eyes of a maiden under the hand of a mistress. So this is the laborer looking unto the one who is employing him. Looking unto him. My eyes are looking unto him. And then. So our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Waiting until. You know. This person, he's not saying, I demand mercy now. <coughs> a servant or a slave cannot demand mercy now. But he says, I will look at God and I will wait until he has mercy on me. Who decides the time? Who decides the time? God decides the time. The master decides the time. And until he has mercy on me, I will look unto him. That is called waiting 
in hope. Dear children of God, when we have faith, it is good. But if we do not have hope, our faith will not be preserved. This faith that we speak of, the faith that we study, the chrysolite faith, is preserved because of topaz hope. This hope will preserve our faith. Dear children of God, faith believes. Truly, faith does believe in God. It is faith that believes and faith that wants and faith that is exercised. And faith will rejoice. But hope will wait until the realization of that faith. I remember one sister had a, a vision. God told her, start running. And so she was running. And she had a destination, a goal to reach. So God said, when you reach that goal, I will reward you. So she was running. And she ran joyfully. Did she believe she was going to reach it? Yes. By, by faith, she believed she was going to reach it. So she ran and ran. She didn't stop running. But then she realized something else. As she was running, the goal also was running. She said she was running. By faith she was running. But now she realized that goal also was running. So what did she have to do now? She had to keep running, but wait till she reached it. So she was running by faith, but she was waiting in hope. Dear child of God, this is called active and patient faith. Our faith must be active. Some people's faith is a very sloppy, soppy, slothful faith. It's not faith at all. It's just called laziness. They just can't believe and they can't be bothered. They won't pray in faith because they're too lazy to pray. What is the excuse? God knows when to give it, so I don't have to bother. So they won't even run. They just stop running. That's not faith. The sister had to run and keep running till she reached. It's called active and patient faith. That means the active part that is called faith, the patient part that is called hope. We must have both together. Faith and this patience or this hope, waiting in hope, must be there. That is what we read in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. First of all, 11, and then we will read 12. And we desire that every one of you to show... The Look, the apostle says, We desire that every one of you, all the believers, what? Show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Hope unto the end. This is very important. Every believer must show full diligence of hope unto the end. Why? Next verse. That you be not slothful. That you do not be lazy, as the New International Version plainly states it. But followers of them. But you must follow those people. Chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. We must be followers of those who through faith and, who through faith and, patience, and patience inherit the promises. <coughs> inherit the promises. Dear child of God, God promised that sister, I will reward you. She believed the promise, but now she found that she had to wait. If she lost faith, she would stop running altogether. If she lost hope, she would run, but her running would be affected because she sees the goal is running. So you can see our hope affects our faith. Through faith and patience, both operating together, we will receive that promise. <clears throat> Why does God want us to wait? Yes, God is saying believe, and we do believe. But then God doesn't give it now. I believe, yes, Jesus is coming again. I believe. But does that faith bring him down now? No. If I believe... That promise of the coming of the Lord, I believe it, but now I have to hope or wait. Why? Why do I have to patiently wait for the coming of the Lord? Why can't I make it happen now? Because 
we have to be patient and wait because in that period of waiting there is a certain will of God that has to take place in our life that is very important and we read of that in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 I want to substantiate all that I say with the word of God tonight Hebrews 10 36 for ye have need of patience that after you have done the will of God ye might receive the promise you need patience, brother, sister, you need patience because then after you have done the will of God, you will receive the promise. The will of God for that sister was maybe that she should run and run and run and run and run. Why? She thought she could run and in two minutes she'll reach that goal. What happens when we run and run and run and run? Hmm? You lose weight, won't you? <laughs> What does the Bible say about losing weight? It does say that. And for that we must run with patience. Hebrews chapter 12. Read the last part of verse 1. Oh well, just read the whole verse. Yeah, for seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of Witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Uh, lay aside every weight. And the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Let us run with patience. So God wants us to run and run and run and run. Because He is teaching us something in that. Let me give you another verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 25. Romans 8, 25. But if we hope for that, we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. We are hoping to receive something that we don't see. But with patience, we have to wait for it. So often we get discouraged because we have to wait. That means we don't have hope. We see the children of Israel, they became discouraged because of the way it's clearly mentioned. They were discouraged because of the way, because someone told them when they were leaving Egypt, Canaan is two days away. Was it right or wrong? It was right. But they were taking 40 years. Someone told two days and they set out with joy. But all the singing stopped because it was taking time. And the Bible says they were discouraged because of the way in which God was leading them. Too long. He was making them wait. Why? Why couldn't he just take them two days into Canaan? Because they had to wait, because they had to do the will of God. Those 40 years, God was doing a work in their lives. Child of God, God can give you your promise, your reward today. But if you receive it the way, when you receive it in your time, you will destroy that reward. Two instances. One, Adam, he ate the fruit in his time, not in God's time. And he destroyed it. Secondly, the prodigal son. He decided when to receive that inheritance. He could not wait for it. He also destroyed it. Dear child of God, you don't decide the time. God decides the time. And we must wait with faith and patience. If we lose our faith, what will happen? What will happen if we lose our faith? We will backslide. When we lose our faith, we will stop running. Can you imagine there is a race? Ten people are running. At least the last person should complete the race. At least he has completed the race. Many die and go ahead of us. And we, in our turn, we complete our race. But what happens if we stop running? Because we lose faith. We will never reach our goal. We will be counted as backsliders. It is because of unbelief that the children of Israel did not complete their race. They were destroyed in the wilderness, we read. Child of God, if you lose faith, you backslide. But what happens if you lose hope? If you lose hope, you may not backslide, but what do you do? When you lose hope, you can't wait. You believe, you exercise faith, and you are so happy when the servants of God say, God has heard your prayer. 
Abraham, God has heard your prayer. And your prayer will be answered in 75 years. What happens? You are so happy that God answered your prayer. But the moment you hear 75 years, all your happiness goes. Why? I want it now. Our lack of faith makes us panic and hasty and we cannot wait. What happened to Abraham? Yes, the Bible teaches us that he had chrysolite faith. But dear child of God, on the way, somewhere along the line, he lost his hope. You know, it's very, very dangerous to lose hope. Abraham, he had faith. Did he, did he say that the promise concerning my son will not be fulfilled? No. He believed it would be fulfilled. But because he could not wait, he had an Ishmael. The fact that he had an Ishmael proves that he had faith. He believed that God would fulfill his promise through Ishmael. But he could not wait for the real Isaac. He had faith. But because he lost patience, he produced an Ishmael. Who was Ishmael? He's the father of the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites occupy the place in Arabia. And they are the fathers of the Muslims of today. Even today we see the second son of Abraham, Isaac, his generation or the children of Israel. Till today they are suffering because of Ishmael. Muslims are persecuting the Jews because Abraham could not wait. So many thousand years later, the promised seed is suffering because of that foolish act of haste. Dear child of God, what a curse it is to lose hope, to lose patience and to decide the time. I can't wait anymore. You've made me wait so long. Saul, he could not wait. So he acted and he lost his kingship. Dear child of God, Adam, he waited, but he could not wait. He went and ate that fruit and he lost his relationship. The prodigal son, he waited, but he could not wait anymore. He lost his sonship. We lose so much by not waiting for God's time. What a curse we inherit when we believe and yet do not hope. This is why hope and faith always go together. If we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and read verse 13, we see hope and faith go together with the added ingredient of love. And now faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity is love. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest is love. Why? Why is the greatest of faith, hope and love? Love. Why is love the greatest? Because when we go to eternity, we will not need faith and hope. But there will be love. Or faith and hope is only for this world. Love is for all eternity. But now, in the present state, in the world today, we need faith and hope. Now let me give you an example. I will use Timothy Benjamin as an example now. Now, I'm promising him a gift. Now, if I tell him, Timothy, I'm going to give you a lovely piece of carpet for your, for your room. He you said, okay, thank you, brother. It's not really something he's looking forward to, but if I say, Timothy, I'm going to give you a seven-stringed bass guitar. Now, you can just imagine. You can't control him after that. It'll be a big problem. We'll all have to pray for him. He'll be so full of joy, so happy. Looking forward to that. That, that promise makes him happy. But after that, he starts troubling me. Brother, where's the guitar? Where's the guitar? I said, Timothy, I promise I will give it to you, but there's a little problem. I don't have the money for it at the moment. <clears throat> when I get the money, I will give it to you. Brother, do you promise you will give it to me if you get the money? Yes. Can you see the guitar? No. But now he has to 
Wait for it with hope. Timothy has to wait for it with hope. So now he is hoping for it. Every day he has to exercise his hope. If he loses hope, he'll get more upset and he'll say, Brother, if you had not made that promise, it would have been far better. Because now I'm having this anticipation and it's really bugging me. But I said, Timothy, you wait for the time of God. So he has to wait. Now, that is hope. That is called hope. At some point, I said, Timothy, good news. What? You got the guitar? No. But I've got the money. I've got the check. I've got the check for the guitar. And I pull out the check and I give it to him. And he sees. 2,000 pounds. When he sees the money, can you believe it? What does he do? He jumps and he's so happy as though he has seen it already. Now he's not waiting anymore. The check is already in my hand. Is the guitar in my hand? The check is in my hand. But seeing the check, he's so happy as though he's already got the guitar. What is that check? That is called faith. First it was hope. Now I've given him the check. Why? He's not seeing the guitar. But seeing the check is like seeing the guitar. That is called faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance of what I have been hoping for all along. Seeing the check is like seeing the guitar. Now by faith I can see the guitar. I can see it as I'm receiving it now. All this while, I hoped for the guitar, but now when I see the check, I am seeing the guitar. Now I know I don't have to wait for it. Dear child of God, now I take the check and I go to the shop and take Timothy, <coughs> give the check, and we collect the guitar and come away. Now does he have to wait for the guitar? There's no hope. Does he have to believe, 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 believe that he's going to receive the guitar? There's no more faith because faith is the evidence of things not seen. But now he's seeing the guitar. So there's no need of hope anymore. There's no need of faith anymore. What's left? Now play and enjoy. That's love. In eternity, there's no more need of faith. There's no more need of hope. But there's plenty of love. We enjoy all that we have been hoping for, waiting for, and believing in. So, if we don't have this faith and hope today, we will never wait for that reward that God is promising us. Dear child of God, read Romans chapter 8, verse 24. Then you will see, because you see it, you don't need hope. Romans 8, 24. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. Hope that is seen. If you are going to see it, it's not hope. Carry on. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? What a man seeth, what Timothy Benjamin can see, there is no need to hope for. So hope is cancelled. And Hebrews 11 1 proves faith is cancelled. So faith and hope are both cancelled when we leave this world and go to heaven. But for this world, what do we need? We need faith and hope and that love. Now that love is called eternal thing. Love is eternity. I tell you, dear child of God, if you do not really love... How many of you love Jesus, by the way? Can you put up your hands? How many of you genuinely love Jesus? Put up your hand. You know I ask trick questions, so you better be careful. <coughs> How many of you genuinely love Jesus? If you don't love him properly, I see one finger go up. If you love him a little more, maybe I see a palm sticking up above the head of the person in front of you. Anybody who really loves Jesus, put up your hand. What I can see about 10 people, the other 40 or 50 are saying this is a trick question and they say, brother, I do love him. God can see my hand in my heart and all that spiritual talk. I don't want to hear all that. Anyway, dear children of God, I'll tell you one thing. 
if you love Jesus and you genuinely love Jesus, shall I make a sweeping statement? If you really, really love Jesus, you will go when Jesus comes. But if you don't love Jesus, you can have a load, a truckload of all gifts and, you know, you may be consecrated, you can be dedicated, you can be zealous, you can have all that without love. Now that's 1 Corinthians 13, the first four verses. You can have faith that can move mountains. You can give your body to be burned, that is suffering. You can give all your gifts away, that is consecration. You can be mighty, you have knowledge and prophesy all those wonderful things. But if you don't have love, you are nothing. That means all that you have is counted as nothing because of the lack of love. But if we have love, I tell you, dear child of God, you will see the face of Jesus. When you see his face, you will know the truth of that statement. Faith, hope and love. The greatest is love. Why? That love, that is the one which will take us to eternity. And what about faith and hope in that verse? Both those are those which are produced by love. How do we know? You turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You read... Uh, right. Verse 7. All things. Love beareth all things. Believeth all things. Believeth. So that's faith. Hopeth all, hope all things. Now that's hope. This all comes from charity or love. Dear child of God, it is through love that we get this real faith and hope. Now, before I continue, I want to tell you, going back to that word topaz, what is topaz? That is the term given to the island where the sailors were. You know, it's not just being inside a building and cut off. Through the building you can see people walking around. But if you're in an island like John, what do you see? What John saw was only skeletons. According to history, John in the Isle of Patmos was surrounded by skulls. You know what skulls mean? He was surrounded by skeletons. Tell me what that means. Come on. Tell me, what does, when you go to an island and you're surrounded by skeletons, what does it tell you? Hit the nail on the head, brother. Tell me. Savages. Savages. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot survive there. Tell me, tell, make it more plain. There are some people who are a bit thick like me. Just see. This is more like, a, can you say a little more, sister? Can you say a little more? You've come very close to it. I'll give you a Kit Kat. <laughs> You're not supposed to have it though, I think. So. Anyway, anyway, she's, she's come to it. You know what that means? That skeleton was a person. It was a person who came. He didn't come as a skeleton. He came as a person and he, he waited, he waited. He waited and he died and after that also no one bothered and now he's become a skeleton and he's still there. So what is surrounding Paul, uh, John? All the testimonies of those who waited and waited and nothing happened. I tell you, waiting in Patmos is not easy. It's not easy at all, dear children of God. Being in an island, maroon, deserted, is a hopeless situation. Topaz is hoping in that island. That is called topaz. Topaz is a little more than normal hope. It is hoping when there is no more use of hoping. 
That is called topaz. If you turn to Romans chapter 4 and read verse 18, there you see topaz hope. Romans chapter 4 verse 18. Who against hope, believe in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Who against hope, believed in hope. Now what does that mean? Who against hope, that means, when there was no use of hoping. Can John, when he sees so many skeletons around him, every skeleton is speaking to John. They being dead yet speak. John, you're going to become one of us, John. We also hope, John. We also believe, John. We confess the promises of God, John. But now look at us. No use, John. I tell you, you can wait. One day you will be one of us and another John will come and you'll be talking like us also. There's no use of hoping. But in such a place, Abraham, not hoped, he believed in hope. I'm telling you, faith is maintained by hope. If that hope is not there, the faith will not work. In, in another translation, the Bible says, who in hopeless circumstances, hopefully believed. He still carried on. Yes, I'm surrounded by skeletons. I'm surrounded by hopelessness. But I still hope. Can you tell me, how can a person hope like that? I will tell you a little later. But let me tell you about the hopelessness of Abraham. The Bible says the circumstances of Abraham offered him no hope. No hope means no faith also. Because if you don't have hope, your faith will lose its value. So, how could Abraham then have that faith made perfect or chrysolite faith? How is it that he hoped? Let us see what his hopeless circumstances were. You will all agree with me if I say there were two ingredients in that hopeless circumstances. One, his own body. Abraham and Sarah were promised a son. But now his own body has become dead. Now what does that mean, dead? Death means no hope. Death means everything is over. Abraham believed and believed and believed to a point. But now, his body is dead. Not only is his body dead, we see Sarah's body is dead. He is surrounded by skeletons. Death, there is no hope. Now, we know about these two things. But let me tell you something else which would have tormented Abraham. And that is his past. What is all in the past of Abraham? Nothing good ever happened to Abraham. We see God took away his father, his father died. Then God took away his people, or as good as the people died. God took away his country, as though the country died. He had riches, he had to leave them. He had one nephew, Lot, he was separated. He had Hagar at least for a while, she was cast away. Then he had Ishmael to hope him, Ishmael was cast out. God never did anything good. Good never came from God in Abraham's life. Now, he is dead, Sarah is dead, and the past tells him that God is dead. Everything is dead. There's no hope. In that place, Abraham was marooned in the island, Topaz. But dear child of God, in that absolute barrenness, hopelessness, the Bible says, he still hoped. How can a child of God be like this? I will answer that question a little later. But I'll turn to another verse. Psalm 130, verse 5 and 6. Psalm 130, verse 5 and verse 6. I wait for the Lord, my soul will wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waited for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I my say, soul is waiting in hope. More than they who watch for the morning. Carry on. I say more than they that 
He's saying it again. I affirm what I say. Oh, verily, verily, I say unto you, my soul waits for God or hopes in God more than the man who waits for the morning. Who's the man who waits for the morning? The watchman. The watchman has to stay awake in the dark. You see, what is surrounding him? Darkness, cold, and loneliness. He is alone. It's an island experience. Darkness and no people around him. In that state, when all the others are cozy in their rooms, snoring away, he has to stay awake and he is waiting for the morning. Especially those who stay awake at night when they are sick, if they are having some terrible illness. I remember once I was talking to one believer, I said, do you get to sleep? He says, no, I can't sleep even at night. It's so horrible. At night, I'm waiting for the morning. During the day, I'm waiting for the night. It's so hopeless, my situation. He was a very active person, but in his sickness, he said, he was envying that person who would run down the road in a bike selling bhajis, it seems. He said, at least he can walk. At least he can talk. But look at me. In that situation, it's a, it's a terrible situation to be in. It is hopelessness. The watchman, he's waiting for the morning. But the child of God who wrote this verse says, My soul can wait more than the watchman. I'm now going to take you into the life of a child of God, described in one particular chapter in the Bible. Perhaps some of us can identify with that. It's a chapter of desolation, a chapter of hopelessness. Let's turn to that chapter. Chapter 3 of the book of Lamentations. The very title tells us this whole book is about weeping and weeping and crying. If you read this book, you get very depressed. It's all about Jeremiah's lamentations. He was called the weeping prophet. There was nothing good. I just would love if we could just read this whole chapter. And I'm sure some of us will just be grabbing it. It's like someone coming from heaven and throwing verse by verse. And we will all say, that's my verse. That speaks of my experience. Now, for example, you read verse 2. <coughs> He has left me and Who is he? It's God. Now read God. Carry on. Read again. God. God has led me. God hath led me. And now read. Carry on. And brought me into darkness, but not into light. What a terrible testimony. God was leading me. I followed God. I trusted God. I believed God. I hoped in God. But now. God has led me into darkness. I think that's a very, very frightening experience. It's not that I chose darkness. It's not that I walked away from God. But God himself has led me into darkness. And verse 1. I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his rod. God in his anger has taken a rod and started Beating me. Verse 3. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. All the day I'm only feeling that God is against me. God is not for me. In the psalm we read beautiful psalm. Somewhere on Psalm 65 I think. God is for me. But here he is against me. And he carries on on and on and on. And uh, Every verse has so much meaning, but we can't do that. Verse 8. Also when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. When I cry and shout, what is crying and shouting? It's a Pentecostal prayer. I believe, I pray, I get filled in the Spirit. At the end, I know God is not listening to me. He shuts out my prayer. And he carries on and on and on. And if you carry on reading, 
this particular child of God will say, I have now become a mockery to others. Now others are even laughing at me. That's the testimony of Job. In this chapter of desolation and hopelessness, this child of God says, I have become a mockery to others. Then further he says, my own family members are now mocking me. And then he says, they are singing and mocking me. They are singing about me and mocking me. And I am tormented alone. This is the testimony of a child of God in this chapter. Who is led by God into darkness. Who is afflicted by the rod of God's anger. And who has become a mockery to others, to the family. And is tormented. Can God allow such a path for anybody? Can God allow it? Yes. God can allow it. What is the reason or what is the result of such a path? You read verse 20. My soul hath been still in remembrance and is humbled in me. My soul is humbled in me. Oh, I can say through such a path, God is dealing with this particular child of God's pride. God is dealing with our pride. Dear child of God, God can give by faith when we believe and say now. You can imagine if Timothy says now and I give him that seven string bass guitar and he found that he got it when he said now. You can imagine he will start asking and he won't stop. He said, brother now I want a big piano. I said, Timothy, I can't give you that. I said, no. You can see what's going to happen if you get everything now. Your head will become big and your pride will really do harm to so many people. So you can see God is dealing with the pride in our soul. And according to each person's pride, so will our trial also be. I know some of the paths through which God led me have been very, very dark and terrible. I also was marooned in that island. I know we can make it all spiritual and say that's because our calling is so high. If we, if we are going to say that, we are only going to feed our pride a little more. Because already we are so proud. In my case at least, I know you all are humble, but in my case, I had to go through that simply because of my pride. I won't say because of calling or anything. When I was in the world, my pride was very great. And when I came to the Lord, my pride became greater still. My pride would not leave me. And if God had to deal with me, and deal with my pride, there was only one place he could do it, Topaz. He had to take me into the island of Topaz and I had to taste darkness and God's anger. And the funny thing is, still the pride doesn't leave me. So I wonder what else God has to do. I dread. But when I think of it itself, I humble myself. God, please, I don't want to go back to Topaz. What does he say? My soul still has them in remembrance. Read that verse again. Verse 20. My soul has them still in remembrance and is humble in me. Oh, when I think of all that happened to me because of my pride, my soul still remembers. Immediately, my soul is humbled in me. Dear child of God, what does the Bible want us to do? What does the Bible want you to do? You must continue to wait for God in your situation. Verse 26. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Everybody look at me. It is good. Now say what? It is good that a man should hope and wait for for the salvation of the Lord. Am I right? It's a trick question. I'm wrong. I left a word out. What was that word? 
And we don't quietly wait. We make all kinds of noises. We murmur, we complain. We do all kinds of things while we are waiting for God. But it is good that you quietly wait for God. That is very good for your soul. Verse 25. The Lord has put unto them that wait for Him to the soul that seek of Him. Dear child of God, I want you, if you're really interested, to go home and read this chapter. There are some treasures in this chapter. Especially those of you who think the hand of God is turned against you or turned against your family or turned against some... You know, you feel God is really afflicting you. You are right. All that is mentioned here is right. But I want you to understand there is something very precious in this chapter. I'll just show you a little bit and then I'll carry on. Um, verse 31. For the Lord will not cast off forever. It's not going to carry on forever, brother, sister. And verse 32. But though he cause a grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. He, though he cause grief, yet he will have compassion. And now, verse 33. <coughs> For he does not afflict willingly. He does not afflict willingly. That means... This path through which God is taking us is against His own will. What does He will? He does not want us to go through this path. He does not want us to suffer. But He has to do it for our good. It, the end of it is what is important. He does not afflict willingly. He doesn't give Him joy and then nor grieve the children of men. He doesn't do it willingly. He doesn't take pleasure in seeing us weep. Yet He has to do it. For the humility of our soul. And so when God leads us in parts for our spiritual benefit. Quite often we are not keen to receive anything spiritual from God. We only want an answer to our prayer. We only want a solution to our problem. We want an end to that difficult situation. Can you imagine a man who is tempted to smoke? A believer who is always tempted to smoke. He has a little accident and he's damaged his fingers. Now he's saying, please pray for my finger. It, it must be healed now. If it's healed now, what will you do with your fingers? Can't you understand the mind of God? So God lets something happen for you to learn. Now what do you do? You believe God will heal you. And you wait. But in that waiting... God will deal with your sin. He will deal with that desire in your heart. And later when the desire is gone, you will find your fingers are healed. Then there's no temptation also. Child of God, he doesn't inflict willingly, but he has to deal with you for your own spiritual benefit. And remember, when a mother spanks a child, the child will think all kinds of things about the mother. But the mother can't be bothered. You can say all you can say about me. I used to say all kinds of things about my mother. And she would say, and she would say right, now show me your other hand. And I, I get her. I said, oh, you're doing this then. Right. Now, next hand, back and forth, back and forth. And she said, now you go to your room and you sit there quietly. You can't go and play. But that's not fair. You're bad. You're this. You're that. That's all right. Now you go. She knew what she was doing. But do you think she found pleasure in that? I call her all kinds of names. Do you think she found pleasure in that? It hurt her so much. We hurt God so much. But dear child of God, why did she do that? If she didn't do that, today I would have been in prison or something. But thank God for God, who does not just react to our tantrums, but deals with us. But one thing we need is hope. Topaz hope. What does Issachar mean? Until I get my reward, I will topaz hope. Until I get my reward. That name Issachar is on that stone. Until I get my reward, I will wait. Now what is this reward? What reward are we going to get? Money? Are you hoping for, to get some money? Let me teach you something. If we turn to Genesis 14, 21... Genesis 14, 21. And the king 
king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Give me the persons, but take the goods. You know what is being offered to Abraham? Goods or lot of material benefits. Now remember, just two chapters ago, God told Abraham, get out of your country. Now Mesopotamia, where he was, was wealthy. It was full of goods. And God said, Abraham, you're full of goods. Now get out of that place. So we can imagine Abraham is leaving all his treasures and he's come up like a pauper. And now the king of Sodom, what is he offering him? Plenty of goods. Dear child of God, this is a temptation for Abraham to get some goods again. What he has left, now he's getting a chance to get it again. Full of goods. I will give you plenty of reward. But what was Abraham's answer? And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. He said, look here, king of Sodom, I lift up my hand to my God. I listen to my God. I will look to my God. You are offering me a reward. Do you know who I am? I am Abraham. I came out from a rich country. I gave up these things for my God. My God told me leave it and I left it. You are trying to give me something which I do not want? I do not want anything from you. Read the next verse. That I will not take from a thread even to the shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. I don't want anything from you. Because you will say, I made Abraham rich. Or Abraham is saying, my riches will come from God. He was surrounded by this king of Sodom and his riches. Child of God, in your hopelessness, you may have this temptation. What is that temptation? No point waiting for God. The king of Sodom has come. Now, you will look to the ruler and the king. You may look to the servants of God or to your relatives. You may look to the believers or your friend out there. You will look to somebody to win their favor. Is that what God is training you to do? Or is God taking you to this path so that you could look up to your God? What is hope? It's lifting up mine eyes and waiting for my God. It is waiting for your God, not waiting for man. Dear child of God, God is training you in this island. If he wanted you to look up to man, then why did he cut you off from man? Why did he cause man to desert you? Why has he allowed you to be marooned in this island to obey us? Because he wants you to be cut off from the arm of flesh and he wants you to look unto God. And when you're looking in unto God and believing in God, God will make you also hope and quietly wait but the king of Sodom will come. Man will come. Rulers will come. And they'll offer you rewards. But do you know what will happen when you look at Sodom? Look at this man. You, your, your trial will end. And you will receive your reward. You'll receive your comfort. After that, you won't stand up and testify, God rewarded me. You will be all the time saying, Well, God raised up the king of Sodom. Ah, and he helped me. Some people testify like that. They testify about the king of Sodom. That was not what God wanted you to do. God did not want you to accept it from the king of Sodom. Abraham was tempted. But he said, I will not take that reward from you. I don't want your money or your protection. My protection comes from God. My reward comes from God. And so saying, Abraham turned 180 degrees, showed his back to the king of Sodom. And he continued to lift up his eyes. And he looked up to God. And he heard a voice. And what did the voice say? Next verse. Chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham and vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy sheep and thy exceeding great reward. A little more life, brother. A little more life. He said... 
Fear not Abraham. You know why? Even though Abraham made this confession, you can imagine, it is not an easy path. He said, I don't want your money or your reward. Abraham, you refuse that. Now I will be your reward. You refuse his protection, I will be your shield. Dear child of God, in this path that God is taking you to build up your topaz hope, to, to do a deep work in you, you will find that you no longer want material reward. You no longer want wealth and riches and some earthly thing. Your reward becomes Jesus himself. You no longer value things. Now your eyes are fixed on Jesus. Who are you being made then? Who is the only one who says, I don't want anything but Jesus? Very good, sister. You've given two good answers today. The bride. The bride alone can say that. Who will say, I don't want anybody but joy? <laughs> right. So, we'll see. It's only the bride who can say, I don't want anything. I don't want anyone but Jesus. So God has to cut you off from anything or everything and anyone and everyone. It's a lonely path. It's a frightening path. It's a dark path. But in this path, dear child of God, God will build up your topaz hope. He's doing a deep work. Now let me answer a question that I said I will answer in the end. Do you remember the question now? How do we get this hope? Is it possible when there's absolutely no more hope? I said, Timothy, you wait here in this hall. I'll bring the guitar. And I go out. And the meeting is over. I don't come back. And you can imagine his mom says, Timothy, it's time to go home. No, mom, I have to wait here for the guitar. Okay. So they wait. But I don't appear. It's 10 o'clock. And the caretaker comes and says, Excuse me, it's time. I have to close, close the place. No, I'm waiting for the guitar. The caretaker then finally will have to become the undertaker. <laughs> you see, the caretaker will do all kinds of things. I hope he's not listening. <laughs> no. He says, You have to get out. He says, No, I will wait. He waits. Winter is over. All the seasons over and he's still waiting and waiting. Is it possible for Timothy to wait like that for me? Who can wait like that? Who can hope like this? How can we get such a hope? That is what I mentioned in passing. This hope is possible only when we love Jesus. This is why I say again, it is very important, not London believers, Please, you forget all the stones, but remember the love of God. Please, if we don't love Jesus, we lose everything. We lose everything, but if we love Jesus, that love produces fantastic things. That is why, after saying, charity, charity, Paul goes through a list of beautiful traits of quality where you find all the foundational qualities. And he says, everything my love. Pastor Paul used to insist that every servant of God, along with his Bible reading, must read 1 Corinthians 13. Because we can tend to grow cold in our love for Jesus. When we lose our love, we maintain our faith and hope and consecration and zeal and prayer all by something else. We can do it for a good name. We can do it for promotion. We can do it just out of zeal, but if we lose love, we have lost everything. We turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. <coughs> For as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have I entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Dear children of God, Everything that God has prepared is for those who love Him. Look at that sweeping statement. 
God has not made it for anybody else but for those who love him. If we lack love, we will never be able to hope. Because if we don't love Jesus, now if we don't know him and love him, the Bible says, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. If we don't love God, you will never know him. I know, and you know very well, if you love a person, you know that person, you will say, I will wait. I know, I know him. How do you know him? Because you're so close to him. Dear child of God, you need that love relationship with Jesus. This love is a relationship. You have to build up your relationship with Jesus. And you know what relationship is. Sit on your mobile phone for five hours, six hours, seven hours, ten hours. I'll tell you if you love someone, you can talk for 20 hours also. How do you do that? Are you paid for it? Someone tells you that your brain cells are sizzling like bacon in your head, but you won't care. Mobile phone radiation, stop it. I need to talk. Love. Love. You will die because of love. Thomas Kempis in the Imitations of Christ, he writes a supplement to 1 Corinthians 13. He says so many things. He says, love never says I can't. Love never says impossible. Love can drive you to crazy things. If you love, you can do anything. But if you don't love, everything will be a complaint. Everything. Can you imagine one person loves another person and then wants to see that person but has to travel for two hours taking two trains and a bus. The hope of seeing that person will fill that person with so much joy. The person will be looking at the time, waiting, waiting, waiting. Finally, you see that person. Now look, look, wait. I want you to know, I had to get into this train. And when I got into this train, I had to stand. And then I had to get down. I had to wait for another 15 minutes for the second train. And the second train also, I had to stand. Then I had to get down, I had to catch a bus. And then I caught that bus, and I caught this, I caught that, and I caught a cold as well. And now I finally, I've come to see you. I'll buy all this, I'm trying to tell you how much I love you. If you love that person, you won't even think I caught four trains. You know, dear child of God, when there is love, you can wait and wait. Jacob waited 14 years because of love. Dear child of God, when we love Jesus, that hope is maintained because of this love. Here Paul says that heaven, the glorious place in heaven, is for those who love him. But do you know, what does he start saying that verse? How does he start that verse? But as it is written. But as it is written. As it is written. So he's quoting someone. Whom is he quoting? Can someone tell me? Which prophet is he quoting? Sister, can you say you may get the third one correct also? <laughs> you can just guess. Which prophet in the Old Testament is Paul quoting? She doesn't want to leave the place saying I gave her wrong answer. Sorry? I won't give you a guitar even though you've given me the verse and the everything correct. Isaiah, yes. He's quoting prophet Isaiah. But do you know, the spirit of the Lord is speaking through Paul. Isaiah does not say for those who love him. Do you know what Isaiah says? He said, for those who wait for him. But Paul is saying for those who love him. You read Isaiah 64, 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither has the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he has prepared for him that raises for him. Uh -huh. No one has perceived what God has prepared for those who wait for him. And the Spirit of the Lord is quoting this verse through Paul saying those who love him or it is only love that can wait. This topaz hope that can wait and wait and wait against all hope is only because of love. Dear child of God, so important to love the Lord for this hope. I tell you, this love is so important. This love will take you all the way through. I'll just end saying a little 
incident, a trance that one child of God went in a trance or a vision and he, he saw heaven. He first saw new earth and he saw plenty of people in new earth. It was beautiful. He said new earth was beautiful and the people there were so happy. But because this child of God was really, really being prepared as the bride, his eyes were amongst all those beautiful people. He was looking for one, but he didn't see him there. Yet the place was beautiful. And then he was transported to a, a higher place. It was new heaven. There again he saw so many saints, so many people. It was more glorious. He said he could describe the beauty of that place. But still, his eyes were looking for one person and he couldn't see him there. Then he was transported to the higher place near Jerusalem. It was a huge place, unspeakable, breathtaking, spellbinding beauty. And as his eyes were drinking in that ethereal, heavenly glory and beauty and majesty and splendor, he realized he couldn't see anybody there. Quite opposed to what he saw in the other two places, here he was faced with an absolute empty place. And he was wondering, can this be New Jerusalem? It is beautiful, but why isn't anyone there? And as he walked, he could see in the distance a small group of people, very small. And as he walked closer and closer, he saw one standing there, the one whom he was looking for. Jesus. He saw Jesus standing there and Jesus was talking to these people and he was so curious and thank God quite often we have this terrible experience when we are just coming to that most important part of that dream where you know you can imagine brother Godwin he's just seeing this dream and he's reaching out <coughs> And saying, God, thank you. And God comes down with that huge pot of gold. And he's taking it. And he looks and God says, you drink this and you'll become like me. He's about to slurp it. And God went, yeah, here's your coffee. <laughs> oh, Mangala, what did you do? What did you do? And he says, just go away. And he closes his eyes. And he's waiting for God to continue that vision. He closes his eyes. And he sees a black crow. <laughs> you can't get that dream back. You know you've had these bad experiences. But this child of God, when he was seeing his dream, he was walking, he was approaching Jesus. And as he approached Jesus, he found Jesus was talking to these people. And he went near and he listened. And he heard what Jesus was saying. And Jesus was saying one sentence, just one thing over and over and over and over and over and he woke up. Do you know what Jesus was saying? In Jerusalem to these few people, to that little flock, do you know what Jesus was saying? His eyes were full of love. His heart was full of love and he spoke full of love and he told those people on earth you were the people who truly loved me on earth you were the people who really loved me shall we stand praise you Jesus hallelujah 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 praise, praise you Jesus well, thank you Lord Father in heavenly Father we thank and praise you for this blessed evening for gathering us together, Lord, to study your word for this great privilege of, Lord, revealing to us the great truths of these foundation stones. We thank you for this stone of your past that you have, Lord, taught us how we should wait in hope, Lord, filled with your love. Whatever our trials may be, Lord, the path may be long and dark, but, Lord, we know, Jesus, that you are teaching us something through this period of waiting, Lord, Father, you are dealing with so many things in our lives, so many areas where we need to be sanctified. 
You are revealing our true state through these trials. And Lord, we want to be filled with your love so that we can wait, Lord, because we have a glorious hope of seeing you. Lord, continue to fill our hearts more and more with your love these days, Lord. We know that those who love you will be the ones who will inherit all the eternal blessings, Lord. I have not seen or you heard or entered into the heart of men what you have prepared for those who love you, those who wait for you, Lord Jesus. Jesus. We know that only your love can give us a place to wait for that glorious reward that you have for us, Lord. Let us keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord Jesus. Let us build up our faith and let this hope also, Lord Jesus, glorious hope grow in us until we finally see you filled with love in that kingdom of love where we will be forever with you, Lord. We empty ourselves and give you the glory, honor, and praise. You are a faithful God and you will do it. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us until Jesus comes in glory. Amen.